Welcome to the greatest panel on earth. I will be your ringleader for this afternoon. And I would like to introduce our panelists. First off, representing Drupal, Larry Garfield. Secondly, representing WordPress, Andrew Nason. Third, representing Magindo, Magento, Fabrizio Branca. Third, representing Joomla, David Hurley. Representing Symphony, Andreas Hux. Representing Laravel, Taylor Otwell. And representing Zen Framework, Evan Khoury. So I'm going to get stuff started out. I'd like for each person to introduce yourself a little more than just the name I gave. And I'd like you to describe your framework's mentality in one sentence. All right. So my name is Larry Garf. Oop, hold on. Don't think our mics are on. Can you make sure that one's on over there, Evan? Check, check. There we go. There we go. My name is Larry Garfield. Um, I'm a senior architect with Palantir.net. We're a web development firm based in Chicago. I'm also uh, the web services lead for Drupal 8, uh, which means I'm one of the lead developers for the project. Drupal in one sentence. People who can't write code should still be able to build awesome websites. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Andy Nason, one of the lead developers for WordPress. I live here in Washington, D.C. Uh, I've led a few releases for WordPress. Primarily, I spend my time either building tools or mentoring committers at this point uh, and dealing with architecture decisions. Uh, WordPress in a sentence would be, I don't know, uh, a powerful publishing platform where users are put first. <clears throat> hi. hi. Uh, my name is Fabrizio Branca. I uh, work for a company called AOE. We do Magento mostly, so I've, I've been around for a while in the Magento community. Uh, I'm their lead system developer. Uh, Magento to me is uh, well, primarily all about the community. That's what I love about that. But to most of the people, it's about flexible and powerful e-commerce. Hello, my. My name is David Hurley. Uh, I'm the community manager for Joomla. I'm also on the production leadership team. Uh, it's a volunteer organization. So um, I'm also the founder of Modoc, which is an open source micromation tool. We were over there in the other room. Um, for me, Joomla seems to represent um, the idea of empowerment, giving, giving access and tools uh, to every type of user, whether that be a web developer uh, or a small shop. My name is Andreas Hux. I work for Sensor Labs, the original creator of the Symphony framework in Cologne, Germany. Uh, I'm a software architect there and um, involved in giving trainings and consulting clients. And Symphony, in a one sentence, is a flexible, multi purpose, um, <laughs> modular framework. Yes. Hi, I'm Taylor Otwell. Uh, I'm from Little Rock, Arkansas. I'm soon to be full-time on Laravel and Laravel Forge. Um, I was the original author of the Laravel framework. And uh, Laravel's motto is developer happiness from download to deploy. Um, I'm Evan Dot, or uh, <laughs> I'm Evan Corey. <laughs> nice. um, I am a programmer. And uh, I own a little company called Rove. And um, Zen Framework in one sentence, lots of arrays. No. Um, <laughs> uh, Zen Framework in one sentence, it is a powerful framework that enables developers to write really good, um, cleanly separated modular applications. And it's an amazing community. All right, for this panel, I encourage everyone to please come up, start forming a line. We do have a mic here. Keith Casey, Paul M. Jones, I expect to see you in the line multiple times. 
while people are lining up, while people are lining up, um, I'm going to go ahead and get the discussion started. I would like to throw out the, the to have you guys discuss that there seems to be um, this continuum between being a framework and being an application. And a lot of the frameworks out there that started purely as frameworks are moving more towards having application features, and a lot of the applications are moving much more towards being used as frameworks. And to, for each of you to talk about your own thoughts on that and your feelings about it. So, whoever. So, uh, Drupal has always had this kind of split personality of being both a framework and an application, or trying to be, uh, which means that at times we, you know, there's a lot of power in trying to ride both of those and also a lot of you know, jack of all trades, king of none. Um, I would actually say one of the changes in more recent PHP with a more mature ecosystem is you know, leveraging a lot of Symfony components and a couple of Zen components and, and things like that means that Drupal can focus be on being an application and a platform and outsource a lot of the underlying plumbing. And I, I say this as someone who was on the framework side of Drupal for a long time, um, that we are drifting more towards being an application and a platform because the framework problem is being solved by other people on this panel, and that's okay, and we can you know, benefit from that uh, collectively. So I, I think that maturity in the ecosystem is helping to resolve a lot of that question by just letting people focus on what they're good at. Someone else? Okay. So one thing that I've seen from the Joomla ecosystem, uh, we started primarily just as a content management system. Um, and through our development process began the exploration of, of a framework through a platform-based set. And what we've seen over the years is as PHP as a whole, as a community, has begun to mature, uh, certain standards have come out which have made it more relevant to looking at us as an application. And instead of looking at frameworks as a monolithic single code base, it's more modular based and it's more of uh, a shared collaboration of finding the, the best pieces to build your application on top of. Anyone else? All right. All the CMSs will just oh. go through and say something. Um, uh, really, in our case, we're focusing on building a product first. And if that ends up with code changes, then it does. Um, and it, maybe it shows. But um, in our case, uh, certainly more and more people are using WordPress as a framework, if you will, uh, in addition to just building a cool application for whatever it is they're doing. Um, we've tried the whole idea of like splitting off the framework and do its own library six, seven years ago which is then what Joomla has tried later on, and we've realized, you know what, we just like to keep going at the path we've been going and what makes sense for us. So th this differentiation, we're like, eh, whatever. That makes sense. Cool. Um, so I, I can speak for Magento Inc., uh, but uh, this has been a hot topic lately in the Magento community. So uh, as you might know, Magento 1 is not really built on Zen Framework 1, it's not a Zen Framework application, but it contains it, it only uses a class here and there. And now with Magento 2 coming up, um, actually the, the idea was what are we going to do? Are we going to build something new? Are we going to refactor that? Are we trying out Symfony or Zen Framework 2 or whatever? Um, I have to say, sadly, Magento decided to basically reinvent the wheel from scratch, and now they build their, it's kind of cool, but it's still like solving the same problem of routing and everything from scratch again in Magento 2. I feel that uh, a lot of applications out there have this arrogance of thinking they could do it better and trying to do it by themselves instead of looking what others are doing and reusing that. So that's a portion of Magento 2 I'm not so excited about, I have to admit. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have some questions up front. Sure, and, and actually it's, it kind of dovetails a little bit into that last question there. And, and, and shortly after the, the uh, release of ZF1, there was a bunch of people who built CMSs and other applications on ZF1, none of them seem to have risen to the level of, of the, the sort of the, the products we have here. And some of the complaints I saw from that is the lack of being in control of the sort of their destiny, right? So that the framework went in a direction that was not geared towards the direction that the product wanted to go. And do you see that as an issue for, for sort of the, the, you know, for, for Drupal or for Joomla or other people who are moving in that direction? That's a totally valid concern, uh, and there are people in the Drupal world who have that concern about our reliance on Symfony. Um, I think there's two mitigating factors to that. <clears throat> One is using uh, component-oriented design. So 
in Drupal's case, we're not using Symfony full stack. We're using bits and pieces of it. So if we wanted to you know, drop the Symfony YAML parser and write our own later if we needed to, we can do that. It's not going to impact anything else. Uh, the other is you know, look at the community behind a framework or component library. Uh, the Symfony community has been you know, very open and very friendly to us working upstream, saying, here's this feature we need to add, here's this bug we need to fix, you know, just doing that in Symfony. Um, and I think if you're looking at outsourcing a lot of your infrastructure and plumbing to uh, another system, which ha has absolute advantages, um, those are two things to keep in mind, is you know, using loosely coupled components wherever they're from, and you know, making sure that not just the code quality is good, but that the community and team behind whatever you're using is also good and flexible and able to work with you. And uh, I think that'll mitigate most of those concerns. Um, so I can speak a little bit from the, the other side of this. Um, from the framework perspective, at least with Zen Framework, one thing that, that we've done a lot is that, that's actually a big motivation um, for the re-architecture that we did with Zen Framework 2 was to give developers and, and projects using Zen Framework the flexibility that they need to be sure that they can have that control. Um, as the framework moves forward, they have the kind of hooks into the internals of the framework to do whatever they need to do. Um, so they don't get locked into a single implementation. Uh, we have event-driven architecture now where you can completely swap out all of the internal implementation of the entire dispatch process from the very beginning of routing to the very end when it's doing view rendering and sending the response to the browser. So you don't get locked into that implementation and have that problem anymore. Um, so that's, that's one way that, that we've kind of been trying to tackle that problem from, from the framework perspective as well. And I think Symfony kind of takes a, a similar approach with that kind of flexibility. I can talk about this a little from a different angle, which I think might be interesting in that we're normally not evaluating external PHP libraries, but we are evaluating external JavaScript libraries. And when we're doing this is that we're not ever focusing, I mean, certainly we're looking at code quality and, and ubiquity and things of that nature, but for us it's more philosophy and their development philosophy and how they really treat their users. So the reason why we use jQuery and jQuery UI so heavily when there are a lot of other libraries out there and there's a lot of other alternatives out there is because not only is it low barrier to entry for developers, but also they don't break backwards compatibility. Uh, and they, we also work with them very closely on a lot of things. jQuery.com runs WordPress. We, of course, use jQuery. We're in each other's IRC channels. Uh, where we, we've gone to each other's conferences, we've spoken at each other's conferences. But when we decided to use Backbone and Underscore in WordPress, it wasn't until we actually sat down with the main developer of, under, of, of Backbone and Underscore and like talked through how do you develop the software. And, and not everyone, of course, can do that with every project that they adopt, but I would encourage it as much as possible that if, you know, if Drupal is going to adopt Symfony, then certainly if you guys didn't meet with them and talk with them, then it never would have happened because it didn't make sense. Uh, so for us, the philosophy is really the number one thing that we're always looking for in an, ex in an external library that we want to be using. All right, next question. Awesome. <clears throat> this is cool because we have a wide variety of customers uh, that all of you kind of sell to, developers, things like that. I would like to know in any particular order what developer experience means to you or your platform and uh, what you actively do inside of your uh, tech stack or community to to basically improve developer experience. So that is something we pay a lot of attention to in Drupal. Um, <clears throat> one could argue we sometimes get it wrong, uh, but that is something we talk about and you know, DX is, I, the I first time I heard the phrase DX for developer experience came out of a Drupal blog post. Um, and a lot of it for Drupal 8 has come down to, you know, let's build it right first and you know, academically right and so on, and then what are the pain points and now let's add shortcuts for that. Uh, so an example there is I've been writing very, very hard on um, proper dependency injection for Drupal 8 for all the reasons that people here should already know. Um, but things like our translation system, you know, do you want to inject that into every single uh, class you have? Probably not. It's a lot of boilerplate for a lot of it. So we have a trait uh, in Drupal 8 that it's, you being, it's just wrapping a service locator essentially, but for that common case for certain types of objects, one line and then you can access the translation system. And that kind of, okay, we've done it right, now let's wrap it with the, the nice pieces, uh, and I'm not going to use the F word, um, is kind of the, with the approach we're taking. And uh, that is something we're trying to pay attention to, and still even now, 
uh, in, in beta, say, all right, what are the pain points? How can we smooth those out without actually breaking the architecture? Andreas, I think you had something. Yes. Uh, for Symfony, um, the developer experience has always meant um, handing the developer out of the box a for your regular, most regular use cases, a working product that, but on the other hand, can be uh, customized to almost every need that there is. Um, that has always been the case, and right now we are uh, running the developer experience in initiative um, that has um, focuses on developer experience. Uh, we have the new installer, uh, easier security configuration, and so on. Um, we also uh, have just published a best practice document um, because historically, um, well, Symfony is very flexible, and historically, um, that was a point that has led to much, too many questions uh, from from uh, beginners. Um, what config format should I choose? Uh, what should my bundles be split up less and so, such stuff? Um, and so, yes, it's a very important point for us. I would just say very quickly is that it, for us, it's. Uh, providing tools to developers to be able to build great user experiences and allowing the ecosystem to then flourish around it. Um, so for Laravel, uh, we kind of took, or I guess I kind of took the approach of like the whole pipeline. So uh, we focused not only just on the code, the API itself, but also on how you develop it locally. So we have, you know, a virtual machine that's tuned for Laravel, and then we have on the other side the deployment platform with Laravel Forge, which helps you get your code all the way out into production. <clears throat> and then you have the middle of actually developing in your app. Your app. And um, I always kind of start from the outside and work my way in because the code, the code is like the UI to, the, to my users. And when I'm designing that, I always design that exactly how I would want to use it in like a dream scenario, my perfect API. And that's what the API is going to be. And then I work into the core of designing it and architecting it from with that standard of API readability um, from the beginning. So it's really the very first thing I do is what's the developer experience going to be when I consume this code? That's the very first thing I think and then work down into the technical details later. Evan, you had something? Yeah, so with Zen Framework, um, one of the, the things that, that I think stands out for, from a developer experience perspective is that the thing that I see developers complain a lot when they're using libraries and, and using frameworks and stuff is that it ends up getting in the way of what they're trying to do more than it ends up helping them. And then that's when you see angry tweets and people pissed off about you know what they're trying to do. Um, so with Zen Framework, uh, I can tell you that one of our focuses was to make sure that the framework doesn't get in the way of what you're trying to do and that you can you know accomplish your goals and, and swap out implementations and, and you know do things like that. So. I think that's important for, for frameworks and libraries to keep in mind is what can you do to make sure that you know if a developer falls outside of your expected use cases, what can they do to work around that and not get frustrated with your library and get stuck? So. All right. Thank you. Next question. So with things like GitHub that make it much easier to share code, especially outside of like a, a walled garden like Drupal.org, how do the projects feel about a lot of the bad code that's out there and how to deal with that? And then for Larry, when is Drupal going to move to Git to GitHub? <laughs> Funny story, the first time I spoke at a Symphony conference, that was the one and only question anyone asked. Um, so we've been discussing whether or not to move to GitHub for at least four years. And we did move to Git uh, off of CVS, which is, thank you. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> um, we've actually recently made the decision we're not going to. There's two things that GitHub doesn't do that are deal killers for us. One, um, GitHub's uh, tag issue tagging system is way too primitive for the scale we need. And two, the uh, pull request process, while really, really good for code review, is terrible for uh, drive-by collaboration, which is a huge part of Drupal's development. Um, you know, it's very common in Drupal for someone to start an, an issue and do part of the work, and then someone else to show up a week later and do another part, and another person another a week later. And that kind of handoff is really hard to do on GitHub. 
Instead, uh, our infrastructure team, now that we actually have a CTO at the Drupal Association and an actual development team there, um, we're going to be implementing uh, something using Git namespaces. So effectively, we'll be doing uh, you know, repository per issue. So you'll be able to push to uh, an issue uh, multiple branches, and then we can you know, review them, push a new branch, and so forth, and then one of those gets tagged as a thing to merge. So we are not moving to GitHub but we are working to improve the problems with patches. <laughs> okay. We're in the exact same boat, but I will add that we are going to test out accepting pull requests optionally through GitHub by the end of the year. We're going to build some tools around it to make sure that it kind of fits more into our patch-based workflow. Um, it's one of my best friends works at GitHub, so he gives me a lot of shit all the time for this. But <laughs> at the same time, I also give him a lot of shit in return for the, the exact issues that, that Larry is pointing out. And if you heard me ranting at the bar for 30 minutes last night about this, um, the, the collaboration really isn't quite there for a lot of, for a lot of what we need. Um, and at the same time, also, we have more user accounts at WordPress.org, and Drupal.org probably is the same way than GitHub has. So yes, there are a lot of other developers out there, but we're also, while you guys are opening up and so are we, we're both fairly insular communities to begin with. And the, for us, we really care a lot more about making our experience better and not like the random drive-by from outside the project better. I guess we're the only ones like stuck on the old versions of crap. So. <laughs> well, well, with that too, how do you how do you uh, mitigate a lot of the bad code that does get shared out there, either via the kind of walled garden systems like Drupal or WordPress, or like Symphony Composer can be pulled in oh, can pull on a lot of code too. So, is there anything that you guys do to help mitigate the bad code that's out there, or just use at your own risk and go from there? I think this would be a better question for just PHP as a whole. Yeah, because <laughs> um, that's really what the biggest stigma is on the community. And it's ironic because then the that stigma then gets passed on straight through PHP from PHP to WordPress in many cases. Um, in our case, uh, plugins go through review, but there's you know 35,000 of them, and there's a few thousand commits a day. So being able to actually review each individual one is not feasible. But of course, we deal with. I was talking yesterday about how we're actually like pushing releases for insecure plugins and things like that. But in terms of bad code quality, I mean, PHP, really, right? Like, that's, that's kind of like part of the whole picture, I think, in a lot of ways, that the long tail is so long and so wide that, yeah, you're going to have a long tail of bad code quality. It's also not necessarily a bad thing. It's not the end of the world that there are, you know, people building websites for $2,000 because someone needs that website and someone's not going to pay any more for that. So to have someone working $40 an hour is fine as long as the ecosystem, you can also support someone making $400 an hour, and that does exist. Okay. All right. Okay. Next question. Hi. Uh, it's not a very specific question. Just want to hear your thoughts about uh, compatibility and backward compatibility and getting <laughs> <laughs> and moving forward because Drupal 8 is all about smashing everything that was done and rebuilding on top of it. But I mean, it happened with Symphony 1 to 2, it happened with Python 2 to 3, it happened, happens all the time. But at the same time, like you, the WordPress uh, you did yesterday, it's all about maintaining like huge code base. So. Well, let's start with <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the uh, Magento is right there right now with Magento 1 to Magento 2. Um, it's, um, I think there should be backwards compatible breaking changes a lot more. I mean, if there are many. Uh, I think that's a good opportunity from a major version release to another one to, you know, fix technical depth, do things right, uh, and that's a good point to break things. Um, the Magento 2 team is still trying to keep all the concepts and everything and try to come up with a good migration path because that's basically what you need to not lose uh, the majority of your community, so it's a hard thing to discuss. Personally, I think uh, it's a good point to start from scratch, and I'm not scared about backwards completely breaking changes if they are communicated uh, well. So, yeah. So what I'd say from the Joomla community is we've kind of seen the, the harm that a very big release that doesn't support backwards compatibility can do to the community in general. So when you get to a com if you, <laughs> well, honestly, I think with ZF one and two, and every, everyone has seen this except for me. When you get to community of size, that becomes an issue, right? And the the pain points of how you 
how you keep that from becoming um, a, a deterring factor um, to uptake in new code uh, does become a bit of a balancing act. And so we, you know, obviously we're all in type of an open source type space, so we're learning from each other and seeing what works and what doesn't. And I think uh, we've come to a much better place now where, you know, we follow more that Semver structure where it's on when you have to introduce something, you introduce it in a major release, and that's the only time that you do so. Uh, and that tr kind of mitigates that as long as you have enough time period in between those, and it's not like every other week you're releasing something huge, uh, it allows more time for developers to get onto that current cycle. Yeah. Yeah, Symphony has, has done backwards uh, b uh, compatibility breaks uh, in the past from one to two. You mentioned that. Uh, lots of people say uh, the only thing that stayed the same is the name, but even that is not the case because we changed it to uppercase S. So, um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, in fact, uh, backwards comp PC breaks need to be there at some point, uh, mostly when, when major language features uh, come into play that are new, which was the case with, with uh, 5.3. Um, and um, but on the other hand, you do that once every couple of years, and after that, the major versions are um, backwards compatibility. Uh, we we're very um, focused on that. Uh, and if you do that, all uh, what what you still need to do is have the major versions overlap. Is what we are, which is what we are planning to do. Uh, Symphony uh, three is going to come out at late 15, uh, November 2015, and uh, Symphony 2.x will not stop at that point. There will be a long time uh, support release at least to 2017, I think. Um, so if you, if you maintain that kind of overlap, then uh, BC break is fine, I think, at some point. I think you know, WordPress is one extreme on that answer, and Drupal has historically been the other extreme. Um, where our, our answer for a long time has been, we would rather have high quality code than backward compatibility. And so each release, we're okay with changing APIs. Um, as you know, pointed out, when you get to a larger and larger scale, it becomes harder and harder to do. The other factor there is um, backward compatibility isn't what you need, it's forward compatibility. This is something Anthony Ferrara has written about, where <clears throat> you, know, you can design APIs in such a way that they can be extended without breaking, and you can also design APIs in such a way that they can't be extended without breaking. And Drupal historically has had a lot of APIs that are very flexible, but changing them requires breaks. A lot of the work that's going into Drupal 8, and the reason it's such a big change, is we're building systems that are much more future compatible. So starting with Drupal 8, we will be moving to uh, semantic versioning and you know, have an 8.1 and 8.2 feature release. We're targeting every six months-ish. Um, with feature additions without API breaks, and then you know, like like Symphony's doing, put in you know, oh, we also have this new version, and here's a backward compatibility layer for it, and then when we get to Drupal 9, several years later, we take out those BC shims, but you've already seen what the new system is, and I think that's a healthier way of doing it. I do agree that um, you know, if you don't want to carry around a lot of baggage, uh, both architecturally and actual code, you do need to sometimes break compatibility. That's okay as long as you do it in a responsible fashion. Um, in Drupal 8's case, we're catching up with a lot of, you know, many years of uh, building the system that will let us do it in a responsible fashion going forward. And so it, it's going to be a bumpy ride this time around, and that's an investment in it being less bumpy in the future. I will say that PHP does have a lot of features that can make backwards compatibility and forwards compatibility a lot easier. Uh, Best examples are probably magic getters and setters, magic call method, uh, array object and array access specifically is something that we've used and that makes a lot of sense for us. Um, but also PHP has a lot of things that make it a little more difficult. Uh, while namespaces could possibly be done in a backwards compatible, backwards compatible way with class alias, I don't think anyone has bothered to try and I'm not really looking forward to being the one to figure it out. Um, like no one's done a plan of action for that, for example, or uh, interfaces. You can't add anything to an interface without realistically being a BC break, so it's kind of frozen in time. So there's a lot of stuff that we kind of just avoid using, even though it might make a little more sense for us. Do you believe that WordPress will eventually undergo some kind of major rewrite, or it's just going to uh, be another? It's product? been ongoing since 2002. 
<laughs> my point was major. I think we, if you look over four years of WordPress changes, you'll see a major rewrite, no different than what you would see between two different Drupal releases. The difference is that they end up switching up a lot of their architecture, of course, and in our case, we end up building on top of what we have and staying backwards compatible in the process. Looks like you had something, Evan? Yeah, so in the case of Zen Framework, we, we have a lot of very large enterprises and, and government agencies and stuff like that building out um, you know, applications that need to have a very long lifespan and stuff like that. So um, backwards compatibility is something that we take very seriously and also long-term support. So I mean, we've, been, we've had Zen Framework 2 out for years now and um, Zen Framework 1 still has support, still gets security fixes and it, it, that support's not going away anytime soon. Um, I think we announced 12 months when ZF2 first came out, but it's just, that's, it's not going to happen. It's not going to lose support just because there's so much momentum and there's so much, there's so many users out there of Zen Framework 1. So um, that's something we take very, very seriously. We, we debate heavily every single tiny backwards compatibility break in Zen Framework. So um, that's just kind of our approach just because of our user base with Zen Framework. So. Thanks. Thank you. Next question. So, so uh, people up here are, are representing products that are in some degree competitors, but at the same time, you're all sort of, you know, winners in the marketplace of idea. You know, we don't have people from, from Mambo or Typo3 or CodeIgniter sitting up there. What do you think made these products successful as opposed to the other ones who are not here? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to answer that this way. One of the things about the Drupal community that I find most appealing and that really resonates with me is if two Drupal developers are talking and trying to work out how to do something, you know that they both have the same goal in mind. Make life easier for someone else. They may disagree about how to do that. One of them may be completely wrong about what's actually going to be easier. Um, but you, you can count on the goal is make life easier for someone else, not make life easier for me for the next week. Make life easier for someone else. And that could be another developer. It could be an end user who's building a site. It could be a, uh, a content editor entering content. You know, there is a goal of make life easier for someone else. And so even when we to get that wrong or forget a piece or whatever, that goal is still there. And that, that mindset means that we build a community that has legs and has staying power and does actually care about making things better for other people. And I think the fact that we're still here in one of the, the top systems uh, in the market, you know, along with many of these others, shows that that does work. Um, I'm actually Server 3 guy. <laughs> I spent many years contributing to Server 3 core. That's my home community, basically, before I started Magento. <clears throat> and it's funny how it sounds like the systems not being here are kind of the losers. <laughs> that hurts a little bit. No, but um, um, I think the main reason why not everybody is represented here is, first of all, it's geographically. Um, Type 3 is wildly popular in Europe. Well, it has been, a little less now. <clears throat> but I think it's mostly also... Um, Type 3, for example, is an open source project that's not backed up by any real company out there. So the biggest difference is there is no marketing budget. So it's a pure development tool, a developer-focused tool, and that's why it can't compete with something like Magento, for example, where there is Magento Inc. spending so much money on spreading the word on that. I think that's the, uh, the, the difference. Type 3 especially has a steep learning curve, and uh, there's many things that weren't nice. It gets a lot better. So I agree that there's lots of people who, who are not friends of type of three, but it's, it's still like it's, uh, um, th there are different reasons that are not always driven purely by code quality, uh, why, why a framework or an application is, is represented somewhere or not. <laughs> uh, I think Laravel's success, <clears throat> you know, when Laravel is, has gotten fairly popular in the framework space and you know, it hasn't, it's just me. It doesn't have a, a company or a marketing budget necessarily, even though my employer has been supportive and giving me some time to work on it. But uh, I think what's helped Laravel 
six seed is it's been very easy for people to pick up. And I, I think I really resonated a lot with um, the WordPress keynote and a lot of the philosophies and core values are very similar in that um, it's very uh, user focused and that it's easy for our users to, um, to start learning the framework. It's easy for someone that's new to PHP to even start using the framework. So we get quite a bit of adoption uh, through just being approachable, so to speak. Yeah, I would say uh, users come first, designing for the majority, uh, treating your content as something that is sacred and uh, end to end user experience. I just said four things that basically mean the same thing. So. <laughs> yeah. All right, next question. Uh, so earlier we touched on developer experience a little bit. Uh, one of the things that I think makes for great developer experience is, uh, is documentation. Having uh, excellent documentation available to uh, is kind of a, a prerequisite for using uh, a framework or an application because if you don't know how it works, if you can't figure out how it works, uh, it makes it much harder to use it. So my question is, what are uh, your frameworks and applications doing to encourage that uh, documentation is available for developers and that it is accurate and up to date and uh, uh, updated when it needs to be? Well, um, I guess uh, I can claim that Symfony has a quite a good documentation history. I mean, Symfony 1, back in the day, basically, uh, I'd say a large part of why it got off so well was uh, the huge uh, documentation, uh, the very high quality documentation that was available at the time, which was back in 2006. Uh, more or less unique for a huge framework um, like that. And with Symfony 2, we, can, we continued from that. Um, we have a great documentation team uh, that's very active on GitHub. We have a, uh, an awesome documentation manager, the gentleman over there, um, uh, who drives a lot of that. Um, we have a, a lot of contributors. How many are there right now for the documentation, Ryan? 200. 200, yeah. Uh, constantly uh, updating documentation both for the framework and the components uh, themselves. So uh, we still, from the historic or the historic experience, uh, we still uh, focus very much on documentation. I could easily talk about this for 10 minutes, but really quick. Uh, we ju just this year we launched a, the start of a new hub at developer.wordpress.org to kind of be the focus of where a lot of our developer documentation will be, uh, rather than it being on a wiki. Um, trying to make it both more curated and also more automated. So we followed Drupal's lead and about a year ago added a committer specifically for inline documentation. Uh, we've had, uh, we had a major inline documentation effort to document like the 3,000 hooks in WordPress, for example, which it's all there. Uh, everything is PSR5. We actually follow that standard and help with it a little bit here and there. Uh, but for us, like this is really important um, because we have a lot of people who don't know what PHP is who want to build something in WordPress. So being able to teach them that is really, really, really critical for us, and always has been. Yeah, I'd say that there's multiple pieces. There's the out-of-band documentation, um, which is you know, on a wiki or a documentation site or whatever it is, where Drupal tries to crowdsource most of it, although we have a documentation team that tries to coordinate. Um, but I would say Drupal's inline documentation, our actual you know, doc blocks and so forth, are if not the best, I would put up as one of the best in the PHP world, uh, certainly the most extensive. Um, and that's you know, we, because we insist that the developers document their code as they go. Uh, you know, a doc block that is not updated with the code is a bug and we reject patches for that. If you know, you're changing the parameters on something, you fix the doc block. If, you, if some, the point of something is not clear from the doc block, you fix the doc block. And so, our generated documentation then becomes very, very extensive. And I, I think that's, you know, there's some people that are annoyed by that and think it's kind of weird that we put that effort there. I think it really helps because it also helps the developer to, to think through what they're doing. And, you know, that, that is your touch point for the documentation must be updated. Uh, so there's files in Drupal where more than half the file is doc block. And I think that's a good thing, especially for some of the low level systems. Uh, so that, that's something we're quite proud of. 
I opened up one of Drupal's files the other day and I got to line 215 before I saw the first line of code. I'm not kidding. It's one of their database, one of the database files. Um, we, I completely agree with everything you just said. You do the exact same thing. I'll paint a little less sunny of a picture. <laughs> <laughs> So um, documentation is, is a tough problem, and um, you know, as a pro as any open source project um, goes, you have to have a lot of discipline, as, as you've seen a lot of the, you know these other projects talk about. One thing that that we've really found with Zen Framework is there is sometimes not an overlap between the people that can write very good code and the people that can write very good documentation. So that's something that we've struggled with. You, you'll have people that will um, contribute something that is an amazing feature and you know really well written code, but um, maybe their English isn't quite good enough to articulate what they were trying to do and stuff. So sometimes you need to kind of foster a little bit more collaboration and, and have people that can step in and help out with documentation for people that have um, contributed code but might not have the skill set to actually kind of articulate what was going on there. So um, that's just a, a little lesson that we've learned uh, in Zen Framework. So. Thank you. Next question. I wanted to thank all of you for your, all of your excellent work on all of these excellent projects. <laughs>so so it was talked about a little bit before with uh, backwards compatibility and I like Larry brought up about you also have to be thinking about future uh, compatibility um, backwards compatibility breaks obviously that you control are one thing but looking into the future down the road PHP 7 uh, how are you especially WordPress do you have any plans in how to deal with that like it's wonderful that we're trying to get up to 5.5 five. I'm glad that we're trying to actually get to modern but in the future as backwards breaks are forced onto the community. Is anyone already looking into that at all? Because it's probably gonna require like ground up rewrites. Um, not thinking about it at all right now. Uh, in fact, uh, we just had our annual conference in a community summit like three weeks ago where we had a discussion on what might WordPress look like when our minimum requirement is 5.3. Seriously. Um, yeah, not even thinking about it for a second. Primarily because we probably won't be able to get our minimum version of 5.6 for another three or four years. Honestly, easily, uh, five PHP seven. I have no idea. So, looking forward to Unicode support finally. But uh, oh wait, no, that's not happening in seven, is it? <laughs> Will that be nine, ten? <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, honestly, not even thinking about it. We follow. We look at some of the internal discussions, and we definitely chime in when necessary. But that's like once a year when it might actually affect us. None of the decisions being made are nothing that we can't account for when we finally get to that point. Uh, we are in fact thinking about it right now because uh, just because uh, we just published a release date uh, or a, a probable release date for Symphony 3. Uh, so the discussion is about uh, what should be the minimum version we support. Um, there's still not a fixed uh, version uh, that it will be. Uh, we just started uh, collecting data uh, about that and looks like it might be 5.5 or 5.6, but probably not uh, seven as a minimum version. Yeah, we're, as Drupal, we're not paying attention at all. Uh, PHP 7 is still quite a ways away. Um, I'm on the internal list, so I am monitoring what they're doing there. Um, and I don't think there's anything happening that would force any architectural changes. There are things that, if they happen, might enable some architectural changes, especially if you know, good asynchronous support happens. But we'll see if that actually happens. I don't know. Um, I think the best future proofing for that, uh, for whatever PHP 7 ends up being, is, yeah, as we've been talking about a bit earlier, loose coupling, decoupled components, uh, stateless code, and so forth, because that's going to make it much easier to, if you need to change your core architecture, you can without breaking these other things and rewrite less of the system when you want to take advantage of those. So um, you know, that's something I've been trying to push in uh, in Drupal, in terms of you know things on the horizon, honestly, something like React PHP is much more different than PHP seven is going to be. Um, so thinking in those kind of terms of what would your system look like in an async world um, in eight years is, is much more relevant. Um, but yeah, that's not an active discussion by any means. Uh, just to quickly add on to that. Um, 
more and more of WordPress is written in JavaScript. In fact, pretty much all new features are. PHP is just the backstop. We use PHP as a means to an end. Uh, and the only PHP feature we actually care about is that it's everywhere. That's it. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Um, Okay, so we're at PHP World, and the whole point of this conference is to bring all our different communities together, and it's an amazing job with that, so thank you, the team. Um, but what do you guys think of, in terms of the communities individually, of your particular small communities, but also the PHP community in general? Like, what do you see the problems are and what the future would be like? Anyone else? <laughs> I'm sorry, I know it's not a tech question. I think the PHP community as a whole is on exactly the right trajectory. Um, you know, we're coming out of our little shells and our you know, little enclaves, most of us, um, and, <laughs> you know, and collaborating more. A lot of the projects on this panel uh, are using code from other projects on this panel. Um, Composer and Packagist are letting us build a PHP code base rather than a Drupal code base and a Joomla code base and a WordPress code base and a Symfony code base. Um, and that is exactly the right move to be making. Um, and you know, if anything, I'd say keep doing what we're doing and just do more of it because we're going in the right direction. Let's just keep going in that direction. So I, I'm actually really impressed and really proud of uh, what the community has been doing in the past couple of years in this regard. Uh, just from a particular practical perspective um, when we are dealing with a lot of when we're dealing with anything related to security we always look at all the other PHP applications and say like how do they handle this do they even handle this if they're vulnerable then we fix it for them um, <laughs> I'm just saying we do, we're not always at insular uh, so yeah um, that, that's just one perspective on, on that for the way we're handling things well um the Zen framework community specifically um, has been just amazing. Uh, obviously, I, I hired a lot of them, so. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I just kind of uh, agree that, that we really are on the right track. The, the PHP community is amazing, so we just need to keep it up and, and keep doing what we're doing. Do you guys not feel like, um, I guess the question I, I could ask next is, well, you've got a load of attendees right in front of you. What is it that you would want them to take home and spread the message of to improve this? Because you're saying it's amazing, but what is it that is amazing? Get involved, if you're not. Solve the general problem. If you, know, you need to write new code for something, don't write, new, don't write a new Drupal module. Don't write a new Symfony bundle. Don't write a new Magento plugin or whatever your extensions are called. Write a standalone PHP component. Yeah, I, I don't actually know. Write, write a standalone <laughs> PHP component that does what it is you need to do, and then plug it into a Drupal module, plug it into a WordPress plugin, plug it into a Symfony bundle. And that way, everyone can use it. Excellent example here, OAuth. OAuth is hard. <laughs> <laughs> but now there's a standalone OAuth library that's wrapped into, that can be wrapped into a a uh, middleware for anything that uses, uses Symfony's HTTP kernel. That means, what, four of us on this panel, something like that, can use that like that without thinking about it. That's the right way to solve those kind of problems. And, you know, just a different piece of glue code, you could use that with WordPress too. That's a good thing. Design your code independent of anyone on this panel. And then write a little bridge to pull it into whichever one of them you need. That's the way you should be developing everything these days, I would say. All right, thank you. So one of the things I think is interesting... <laughs> one of the things I think is interesting with a conference like this, and I mentioned it previously, is it gives us a chance to get outside of our own silos. And for an attendee, it gives you the opportunity to expand your tool set. You know, as a dev, what is it that you're coding in? And if you're coding in just one particular thing, then a conference like this gives you the opportunity to experience a lot of the different ones and probably begin to see the similarities between them uh, as the talk was given earlier today, which was fantastic, gives you a real opportunity to grow your own knowledge and what, what you're good at and uh, make you a better developer. I would just add um, collaboration is good. Uh, a lot of what we could probably do is call out and kick out the trolls and the poisonous mm -hmm. people and the people who just want to throw grenades 
And uh, yes, Cal is waving his arms in the back. I'm not referring, <laughs> Cal, I'm not referring to you. Um, but I think that maybe the PHP community would be a lot better off if some of the mailing lists and discussions didn't look like people needed to graduate to first grade a lot. <laughs> And, and if you want an answer as to why WordPress doesn't get involved in those discussions, that's a pretty good one right there. I want to further the discussion about cooperation because I know that Laravel and Drupal are now built on Symfony components, but is there any plan to like strip a lot of libraries and get more like stuff that people already use? They will got custom codes like functions of thousands of lines and stuff like that. It's get more tested and everything. You have any plans to rewrite parts of it? Of it? We just did. <laughs> yeah, you just did, and, and Laravel is kind of known for that too, but <sighs> meet the others. Can you repeat the question for me? Sorry, I couldn't. The, the question. Get up on the mic a little if you want. The question <laughs> is that uh, is it, are there any plans to rebuild more parts of the framework and to use more parts that already exist so we can centralize? I mean, it's kind of going forward with the PHP fig and stuff like that. E yes, we, we've done that. Like in Laravel, going from Laravel 4 to 5, we ripped out all the environment detection and used Vance Lucas's environment library. So there are situations where we have done that. Um, we ripped out our routing and went to Symphony's routing course. Um, I can't think of anything coming up right now, but I'm, I'm kind of always looking for ways to, if there's a complex problem, if I can farm that out to someone that specializes in that problem, then that's always good, uh, not only for me, but really for the users as well, because someone's paying attention to that library with a lot more care than I might have time to do. So I am always just kind of scanning the landscape, so to speak, to see what's out there. So um, with Zen Framework, the next big release. This is something that we've been discussing uh, semi-quietly and, and there's going to be a kind of more official announcement um, sometime soon, but um, that's kind of a big direction shift that, that we want to take with Zen Framework, which is kind of embracing that, that there are really good libraries out there. We're going to be um, splitting all of our components into their own separate repositories that have their own release cycles and everything. Um, finally, yes. Um, so we're, that's one big step. We're going to be introducing a middleware component that will help with compatibility between third-party code and, and Zen Framework and help other projects be able to consume our libraries and vice versa um, with, you know, with, without the kind of trouble that, that you've historically had with that. So that's, that's a big move. And I think the community overall has been making this shift. And, and that's a really good direction that, that we've all been taking. So. Thank you. Um, so um, talk about sharing code between projects and stuff like that, which is awesome. Uh, um, so several of the projects up here, I'm not totally familiar with every single one of your, the projects, but I know many of you are using Composer to uh, you know, share packages. Um, so can some of the uh, frameworks who, who doesn't use Composer, um, think about WordPress, for example, uh, talk about uh, why not and if that's ever going to be a thing? I mean. I guess, again, I know a little bit about WordPress, and it might not make sense in terms of user, uh, like user experience installing any WordPress stuff like that. I don't know, if, is all of you using Word, uh, Composer right now, or <laughs> Drupal 8, right? <laughs> Thank you. So in Drupal 8's case, uh, we're using Composer to pull in third-party code, and we're using Composer for our autoloader. But we are abusing it at the moment. We're actually checking our vendor libraries into our repository. That's mostly because our build system is still kind of primitive. We want to fix that. Um, and you, you can't install Drupal via Composer yet. I would, and you know, Drupal modules don't install via Composer. I would love in Drupal 9, which is several years down the road, to get to the point where you know, we are using Composer to install our own modules. Um, the blocker for that is one, just time to make that transition. And two, Composer assumes that you're a command line user. And we try to support non-command line users and people for whom FTP is the best they've got. And I, I, I get, it's a, a concern for you as well that um, you know, using Composer if you don't have the command line is an unsolved problem. And if we could solve that problem, then I'm totally there for Composer all the things. 
but we're not quite there yet. Um, if you could help us get there, that would be an awesome thing to do for the community. <laughs> This is a decent subset of the WordPress community that uses Composer for their deployments in the sense that they're setting it up where they have WordPress, they have plugins, all their plugins are done through Composer. You as well, good. Um, that's that's good. Uh, there's been discussions uh, it, uh, on our on our bug tracker about like whether we should add a Composer file and things like that. And actually, from people who were normally would go to conferences talking about Composer and how great it is, have argued against it for the the basic. I mean, one example: you can't put WordPress in a vendor directory. It won't work like that. It's just not designed to work like that. It's designed to be uploaded and you run it, and that's it. Um, and obviously, there's there are issues with command line and things of that nature. Um, I don't think there's any harm in using it. In in our case, um, we also don't have a whole lot of vendor stuff that we pull in. Uh, and the stuff that we do, almost all of it is JavaScript. Uh, and, and in that case, that's actually pretty much the vast majority of our external libraries, certainly any of the ones that anyone here has heard of. Has heard of. And for that, um, I mean, most of our PHP external libraries are to work around the fact that there's a PHP extension that isn't there, to be quite honest. Whether it's ID3 or HTTP or anything like that, like this is why. So for us, um, yeah, uh, we use Grunt as our, as our, as our main uh, tool, and for that, I mean, that's really all we need to use. And Composer doesn't really fit what we need. What we need right now. Yep. All right. Okay. I think this will be our last question of the day. Uh, so, I know. I know nothing from Keith and Paul. So tooling. Back to the developer experience stuff. The tooling has historically been a weak part in PHP. We had what, pair. Um, and you know, compared to especially you know Java or Rails or Node.js more recently, can you guys talk about sort of what you're doing to solve that? What sort of uh, tooling that you're you're looking to implement or have implemented right now? Besides Composer? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, sort of any sort of uh, um, you know that, that covers them. You talked about Grunt being as for. For build, for for but also you know there's the FCLI for scaffolding or you know are there other tools or are you looking to, to build them internally or rely on again Grunt or Gulp or Yeoman or Bower or pick one you know anything? I mean it, it's kind of a mixture because it, part of it's up to you as a developer to pull in those tools and start using them. Um, we as projects, a, a lot of us do provide some tooling. We have like. Um, you know, the ZF command line tool that you, that you spoke about, and like Doctrine has its own command line tool. Um, so that they exist, and, and they are things we're working on and, and have provided. Um, but you know, some of those other tools, pulling in front end dependencies, stuff like that, that's mm -hmm. kind of up for you, er, up to you to implement in your stack. And those tools are available, and um, you know, use them. Anyone else? Uh, we're probably perhaps maybe the furthest along than on this, um, just because we use Grunt very heavily for our build process. Uh, whether it's um, at primarily, obviously, we're dealing with dealing with you know minification and compression and uh, auto prefixing, compressing images. I mean, whatever we can do through Grunt, we're we're doing it right now. Uh, we have a ton of stuff going through there. And when we first did it, there was a lot of people were like, why aren't you using like a PHP task run? I'm like, does one exist that is, can do any like half or a tenth of what Grunt could do? No. And really, nor does it need to. There's nothing wrong with JavaScript being something that we use, at least for us. We certainly think that way. Um, so for us, like it's worked out really, really well, well with, in terms of using Grunt, which we've been using for more than a year now. Yeah. We Drupal has built a lot of its own tooling historically because there wasn't any standard tooling. Um, and now we're trying to replace a lot of that with standard tools. So uh, we have our own integration and testing system, uh, which was originally built on Drupal because, well, why wouldn't you? Thank you for laughing. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we're in the process right now of replacing that with something built on Jenkins. Jenkins is Java. I don't care. It works. Um, there is a scaffolding tool being built for uh, Drupal 8 to help generate uh, modules, and it's using the Symfony console component for it because it's there, it works, it's good. Um, there's, uh, you know, we, we have our own development uh, toolkit called uh, Devel, but there's also uh, been a port of Symfony's um, web profiler to Drupal. It's still a bit shaky because Drupal 8 is in beta, um, but that's 
a great thing. That means it's that another solid tool that's using the same, hooking into the same core pipeline that we are inheriting from Symfony, and so we inherit the tooling as well. Uh, so a lot of that just, the more we're shared, the more the tooling can be shared too. And that's uh, an ongoing process, but a process that is continuing and conti should continue to improve. I did, I did mention this yesterday, but the vast majority of our scaffolding and everything else, it does exist in WPCLI. So we have a command line client that does all of this as well. All right, well, thank you to all of our panelists. I'd like you to all give them a great round of applause for being up here. <laughs> <laughs>